play. It's the New York Yankees nine and the Pittsburgh Pirates nine. And Ralph Berry, of course, on the mound will be facing Mazeroski. And to go over that, uh, there a play once again. It was a hard hit drive down the first base side. The Nelson fielded on the first hop and tagged the bag at first. That eliminated Berry. He was out. And then uh, Mantle could have been in a rundown, but it was not the case. He dove back safely to first base. Here's a ball one. Too high down to Mazeroski. And the Yankees have tied the game. have a stolen base the entire season so you're not going to run you're not going to hit and run you got to wait for a gapper that is fair down the right field line Giambi on his way to third and they're going to wave him around the throw misses a cutoff man shot into the plate out of the plate Derek Jeter with one of the most unbelievable plays you will ever see by a shortstop both cutoff men were missed Jeter coming down the line, fielded with his bare hand, a shovel to Posada and Gian. And look who's coming up. to him to light the fire and all year long he answered the demands until he was physically unable to start tonight with two bad legs the bad left hamstring and the swollen right knee and with two out you talk about a roll of the dice this is it if he hits the ball on the ground I would imagine he would be running 50% to first base. So the Dodgers trying to catch lightning right now. Fouled away. He was, you know, complaining about the fact that with the left knee bothering him, he can't push off. Well, now he can't push off and he can't land. He's going to use all arms. Look at his crowd on its feet. What a tribute. Four three A's. Two out ninth inning. Not a bad opening act. Mike Davis by the way has stolen seven out of ten. If you're wondering about Lasorda throwing the dice again. And he's standing on an outside corner. He's not going to give him a ball to pull. He, with Davis, he just missed. But here's two quick strikes, both fastballs that kind of tail away the outside part. Hassey is not even flirted with the inside part of that play. You saw Dave Duncan gesturing. He was gesturing to Carney Lansford at third. 0 oh, and 2 to Gibson. The infield is back with two out and Davis at first. Now Gibson during the year not necessarily in this spot but he was a threat to bunt no way tonight no wheels <laughs> they're plenty deep in the outfield and a lot of room they're playing him straight away in center field look at it right down the line he's a threat now with two strikes.
No balls, two strikes, two out. Little nubber, foul. And it had to be an effort to run that far. Gibson was so banged up, he was not introduced. He did not come out onto the field before the game. You can really see the limp. Uh, he's not driving that ball. It was by him. Let's see. He's really almost, he almost has to talk to his legs and say, hey, let's go. We got to get out of here. It's one thing to favor one leg, but you can't favor two. No way. And that's what he's trying to do. He really is. Oh, and two to Gibson. Ball one. And a throw down to first. Davis just did get back. Good play by Ron Hassey using Gibson as a screen. He took a shot at the runner, and Mike Davis didn't see it for that split second, and that made it close. A lot of times what you do, you'll give a sign to the first baseman, say, now be there. They call it now be there play. If I get the ball, I'm going to throw it. 14 fastballs in a row. That's all he's been throwing. There goes Davis, and it's fouled away. So Mike Davis, who had stolen 7 out of 10 and carrying the tying run, was on the move. They wanted to give Gibson a good shot at it with two strikes, but with the two strikes, Davis a threat, as we said, because the blue pin will score that big run. Gibson shaking his left leg, making it quiver like a horse trying to get rid of a troublesome fly. Two and two. Mike Sosia can only sit now and sweat it out. He let off the inning and popped up. Tony La Russa is one out away from win number one. Here's the big pitch. He's got to make it happen on this one. Two balls and two strikes with two out. Those extra steps that Davis will get if the count goes to three and two are very big. So Hassey and Eckersley want that pitch of decision right here. There he goes, way outside. He's stolen it. Hassey started to throw and kind of bumped Gibson, but it was way too late. Davis was way down there, almost as if he could have walked in. Not a bad pitch to handle for Hassey outside. Now watch when he starts to throw. Look at Gibson. And Harvey says, no, no, he had the base stolen. So Mike Davis, the tying run is at second base with two out. Now the Dodgers don't need the muscle of Gibson as much as a base hit. And on deck is the leadoff man, Steve Sachs. Three and two. Sacks waiting on deck, but the game right now is at the plate. High fly ball into right field. She is gone. tries to pitch Pete the way Lamar Hoyt did last night and that would be fastballs in and change ups away. Rose looking for hit 4192 and it's one ball one strike and he really had a confident rip and that was a fastball in tight 
which I think is the way that they'll try to pitch him since they were successful with it last night. And that is really the only spot in Pete's batting stance that he's vulnerable in. If you have a lump in your throat, you're only human. And it's two balls, one strike on Rhodes. Everybody on their feet here in Cincinnati in a worldwide television audience watching these moments tonight here at Riverfront Stadium. 2-1 pitch from Shao in the left center. There it is. Rose has eclipsed Cobb. That's number 4,192. Number one, the shot heard round the world. During the fifth innings over the past several weeks, the fans in this ballpark responded incredibly. I'm not sure that my reactions showed how I really felt. I just didn't know what to do. Tonight, I want to make sure you know how I feel. As I grew up here, I not only had dreams of being a big league ball player, but also of being a Baltimore Oriole. As a boy and a fan, I know how passionate we feel about baseball and the Orioles here. And as a player, I have benefited from this passion. For all of your support over the years, I want to thank you, the fans of Baltimore, from the bottom of my heart. This is the greatest place to play. This year has been unbelievable. I've been cheered in ballparks all over the country. People not only showed me their kindness, but more importantly, they demonstrated their love of the game of baseball. I give my thanks to baseball fans everywhere. I also could express my gratitude to a number of individuals who have played a role in my life and my career. But if I try to mention them all, I might unintentionally miss someone and take more time than I should. There, there are, however, four people I want to thank specially. 
Let me start by thanking my dad. for Henry Aaron. So the confrontation for the second time. Aaron walked in the second inning. He means the tying run at the plate now. So we'll see what Downing does. Al at the belt delivers, and he's low, ball one. And that just adds to the pressure. The crowd booing. Downing has to ignore the sound effects and stay a professional in pitches game. One ball and no strikes. Aaron waiting. The outfield deep and straight away. Fastball is a high drive in the deep left center field. Buckner goes back to the fence. It is gone. Dave's number one, there's no question. He was one of the very greatest hitters ever. The 1932 series is Babe's last, yet it produces his greatest moment. Babe Ruth in 1932 either did or did not call his shot off Charlie Root. Yeah. Oh, what a moment. I'll never forget it was a tough series. Both clubs riding each other, doing everything to get each other's go. Well, I had this one particular time when I went to bat. Charlie Root was pitching. Yelling from the Cub dugout was positively sulfurous, as well as from the fans. They were, they were in on this. This was a Chicago crowd, and they were throwing things and yelling, and Ruth was standing in the batter's box, yelling back at them between pitches. And the first pitch ball was a call strike. Well, I thought it was outside and didn't like it very much. More yelling back and forth. Strike two, more yelling. Well, I didn't like that one either, so I let it go by. Well, I stepped out of the box, and by that time, they were over there going crazy. The volume coming from the stands was so loud that some of the Cub players were running out of the dugout and cupping their hands with their mouths to make sure Ruth heard them. And then he makes his famous gesture. Well, I looked down at center field, and I tore it. I said, I'm going to hit the next pitch ball right past the flag ball. Well, good Lord, must have been with Gary hung up an amazing mark by playing in 2130 consecutive games. Then a fatal disease attacked baseball's Iron Man. In Yankee Stadium, touched to tears by the tribute, Gary made his last public appearance. For the past two, the past weeks, two weeks, you've been reading been about reading a bad break. Today, Today, I consider, I consider myself, myself the luckiest, the luckiest man, man on the face on of the, the face earth. Of the earth. When you look around, wouldn't you consider it privilege to associate yourself with such a fine-looking man as a standing in uniform in this ballpark today? That I might have been given a bad break, but I've got an awful lot to live for. Thank you.
The Negro Leagues were a benefactor of World War II in a secondary way. The war broadened the mindset and opened up an opportunity for white Americans to see that perhaps we need to make the field level here. The major leagues were supposed to be the best, but then the major league teams would get beaten by a team that had all black people on it, people that were supposed to be inferior. They knew they had to break that barrier. Newspapers and newspaper writers, very important, because they were always telling the story, especially black publications. They were responsible for documenting this history that you didn't read about, hear about in national news. It was really in our black newspaper. And one of those I want to salute is Sam Lacey. Sam Lacey is, outside of my father, the biggest influence in my life. I think one of the most important journalists in the annals of American journalistic history. He's in the National Baseball Hall of Fame's writer's wing. He was at every major sporting event in America. He became the voice of black baseball. Sam had a unique writing style. You couldn't look past the truth that was in Sam Lacey's stories. One of his quotes was, all men are created equal, but some men are created more equal than others. And that was his definition of white privilege. Sam Lacey was very instrumental in getting Major League Baseball to integrate. He had several conversations and meeting with Clark Griffith, the owner of the Washington Senators. According to Sam, many of those meetings did not go very well. There were a lot of promises made, none were ever kept. Clark Griffith made so much money from renting his stadium to the Homestead Grays that a lot of these owners were against integration because they knew if black players were playing for white Major League Baseball teams and there were no more Negro League games, then they would lose that significant chunk of revenue that they'd been earning. But Sam was persistent, and he wrote a lot of articles challenging Clark Griffith to uphold his commitment to integrate the game. George Kennesaw Mountain Landis, who was the commissioner of Major League Baseball, was very vocal in his stance that as long as he was commissioner, there was never going to be a black man playing in the Major Leagues. In my opinion, one of the most racist men in baseball history. He's on record telling Root Foster that you give our league a black eye when your teams beat our teams. He had an opportunity to fix the game early, but he refused to accept the responsibility, and the game was not repaired until he died in 1944. Happy Chandler becomes the next commissioner, and Happy Chandler opens the door for Jackie Robinson to become the first black player to play in the major leagues in Major League Baseball's organized history. When we talk about Branch Rickey signing Jackie Robinson and integrating Major League Baseball, he pushed for integration in a way that didn't honor the desires and the needs of everyone else around him. Kansas City Monarchs received zero dollars. They've got nothing for Jackie Robinson. October of 1945, Jackie's deal was announced, and spring of 46, Branch Rickey signed other players in addition to Jackie Robinson. Branch Rickey is in their backyard. He is continuing to steal players without honoring the Negro Leagues, without honoring their contracts, and the Negro National League owners were absolutely livid. He essentially put the Negro League owners between a rock and a poorhouse. There's no way that the other owner can stand up and protest what every black baseball fan in America had been waiting, and that was for a black man to play in the Major League. Effa Manley is the most important female in baseball history, black or white. The first woman to be inducted into the National Baseball Hall of Fame. She was the queen of the Negro Leagues. Effa married Abe Manley, and Abe was a huge baseball fan. So in 1935, he purchased the Newark Eagles. From the very beginning, he relied on her to kind of run the business side of things. As co-owner, Effa pretty much did everything except perhaps player scouting. But she handled player contracts and negotiations. She scheduled games. She bought uniforms and equipment. Perhaps most importantly, she was responsible for public relations and community relations. She was constantly trying to figure out a way to use her platform with this team to give back to this community. As they integrated the major leagues, Effa held out. I think Effa knew just as well as all the other owners knew that 
baseball's integration was going to kill the Negro Leagues. Branch Rickey, not too long after Jackie Robinson, comes calling for Monty Irvin. Monty Irvin was a superstar player. Well, Effin Manley essentially refused to allow him to be signed by the Brooklyn Dodgers without it being contested. She felt like, I have contracts on these men, and if you want them, you will pay me. She was criticized by the black press for hindering integration but she stood her ground. Effa always knew she was going to do whatever she had to do to make sure that he had an opportunity to play Major League Baseball. So she ended up negotiating with the owners of the New York Giants. They agreed to buy his contract for $5,000, again, far less than what he was actually worth. So essentially, Jackie's stolen, but she got compensated for people like Larry Doby. Her stance in fighting for compensation for her players is what essentially opened this up for other Negro League owners to at least start getting paid for players who they would then sell to the major leagues. But I think all the owners at that point in time realized that the handwriting was on the wall. It wasn't a matter of if the Negro Leagues were going to fold. It was simply a matter of when they were going to fold. Now 2-2. Two -two. Swing and a drive! Ronald Acuna Jr. destroys a baseball! That's how you break a slump. You ask me, how do you, do, <laughs> how do you do that? You lay off those pitches, you lay off the things, and you get a cutter right down the middle at 89. You couldn't ask this ball. Look, he's trying to go up, and he left it right down the pipe. And you can see right there, Ronald, Chip, that emo that's a lot of frustration let out right there on that swing.